Jim, do you have the clicker? Oh, come on, Nick. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, OK, so I was on vacation last week, and I was working on my 45-minute presentation. And I was not looking at emails. Um, so I was working on the presentation, and then when I got home, I looked at emails. And I have a 15-minute presentation. So we're going to go really, really quickly. So that's me. There's two slides already out of the way. Uh, Kim mentioned uh, what we do. So I'm the, um, we own Canadian Money Saver, and I started 5i Research eight years ago, and it's been a lot of fun so far. There's my little disclaimer. Um, so we started uh, a new service at 5i called Portfolio Analytics in April. This is not a commercial about that. Uh, if you want to learn about it, just visit our booth. But what we want to do today is tell you what we've learned from looking at live client portfolios over the past uh, five or six months. So a lot of people make mistakes in their portfolios. They, first off, they gamble too much. They, they, they hear a tip from their dentist or their lawyer or their friend or a cocktail party, and they go into a stock they've never heard of, and three years later, it's down 80%. They wonder why they even bought it in the first place. So stop the gambling, take your losses, get your mistakes out of the portfolio. And when we look at our clients' portfolios, Sometimes we see hundreds of companies in there, and they just never want to sell. Uh, their strategy is to sell when I break even, or I hope it goes back up. Both of those are really horrible investment strategies, and breaking even should never be a strategy. You're, you're here to make money. More positions are, uh, if you don't have a, a position of 1%, really, why bother? If you have a half a percent position, and it triples, it's not even going to impact your portfolio because you're going to have another company that's going to go down enough to offset it. So if you're going to do your homework, if you're going to take risk, make sure you get paid for the risk you're taking and have a significant uh, position within your portfolio. If you cannot buy a 2 or 3% position in a stock, maybe you shouldn't buy any of it. If you're not that comfortable to risk 2% of your money, why would you want to risk any of your money? It clearly is not something you believe in, and clearly it's not something you should probably buy. The other thing we've noticed over the past six months is clients have way too much cash. And I don't know if that's a reflection of the fact that everybody in the world is expecting a giant correction, recession, market, cr market crash, or if the media is talking about short-term events or the yield curve inversion or whatever it is. Everyone seems worried. And we, we've been looking at clients that are 35 years old. They have way more income than expenses, and they're sitting at 30 or 40% cash. And we're like, why would you want to do that? Every day you have more money coming in. Every day you can invest. And in fact, at 35 or 40 with excess cash, you actually want a market crash. Why would you even want the market to go up if you're continuing investing? So keep an eye on your cash. The other thing that people do is they don't consider their time frame. Uh, the average life expectancy these days is way higher than it used to be. Uh, people are healthier than they were before and someone could retire at 55, and they could have 40 years left. And that's a pretty long time frame for investing. You do not necessarily have to load up on bonds. Uh, you want to have some growth. You want to have some inflation protection. And you want to have some enjoyable retirement time. So you may need a higher return to get that enjoyable time. And if you're too conservative, if you have too short of a time frame, you're not going to take some of the equity uh, risk premiums that you're going to get, and you're going to be too conservative, and you're not going to enjoy yourself as much in your retirement. So my uh, father-in-law is 98 years old, and he's now been retired for far more many years than he actually worked. And uh, he has a TFSA, and every once in a while he asks me for some advice. And I will give him a couple of, uh, you know, I'll give him like some conservative stocks to suggest for his TFSA. And he's 98, and he goes, no, I'm looking for a little bit more excitement here. <laughs> So one thing that investors tend to do is they focus on the, in the index way too much. It's like, did I beat the index? What's the index doing? And especially when they go to their advisor, you know, if their advisor has underperformed the index, they think their advisor's useless. And it's really not the case at all. First off, you want to look at what index you're looking at. Nick was talking about technology. So everybody knows in Canada, it's all about banks, resources, and energy. And if those sectors do not do well, the index is not going to do well. And if those sectors do well, the index is going to do well. But you can't spend the index. You can't use it. You can't do anything with it. All you can do about it is talk about it with your friends. Oh, I beat the index. Really, who cares? You cannot do anything with it. So take a look at what you need to do. What is your goal? 
Um, if you want to be conservative, then have more sectors represented. If you want to be risky, then load up on technology. It really is up to you, and all this focus on what the index is doing is really quite useless as far as we're concerned. So a couple of reasons why the index is not, not something to focus, focus on. First off, it's market cap and float uh, weighted. So the bigger the company, the more likely it is to go into an index, in the Toronto index, and the more likely it is to have a higher weighting. So back in the day, they've changed the index inclusion rules a little bit, but back in the day, Nortel was 46% of the index. Really, do you really want that exposure, even if it's the greatest company in the world, which it clearly was not, do you want that risk? Do you want half of your entire portfolio based on one company? I would not suggest that for anyone, and, uh, but that's the way a market cap index works. The other thing is, of course, uh, the sector dynamics. Canada's got large companies in certain sectors, so they go in the index and they overskew the, these, the sector weightings. But really, I'm a, I'm a growth-focused investor and I love small cap companies. But a market cap weighted index completely forgets about the small companies. It also completely forgets about those companies that are tightly held by insiders. So if you're a great company, but your insiders own 55% of the company, you're not likely to go into that index. But me, I would rather have a company where the insiders are on the hook for billions of dollars than a company that just issues stock and creates a larger public float so they can get into the index. So it's one of those scenarios that you just, again, forget it completely. The other thing, of course, is the index tends to be um, uh, in hindsight. They look at what companies have done, and then they adjust the market cap, and then they adjust the index inclusion based on that. So this week's a great example. So uh, the TSX decided to kick out, I think it's six or seven energy companies. They've all gone down in value, market caps dropped, time to get those out of the, out of the way. Well, you all know what happened over the past 10 days. Energy stocks decided to go way up after the Saudi attack, but these guys are coming out of the index on Monday. That's not going to be stopped. It doesn't matter. And they may be really, really good performers next year, but they're out of the index and they won't get uh, reported in the index uh, performance. Keep going. Um, we talked about this a little bit. Um, Nick touched on it better than I will. Technology is far under, underrepresented in Toronto. It really needs to uh, improve. There's some pretty good companies out there. Some of them are smaller, so they don't get in the index. Some of them are tightly controlled, so they don't get in the index. But um, if you're looking for technology exposure, we highly recommend that you go down south to do it. Other things, um, you can get some really silly valuations in the index. Again, it's not about valuation. It's not about quality. It's about size. So, of course, with all the cannabis stocks going way up, lots of them went in the index, but a lot of them were trading at 45 or 50 times sales or a billion times earnings because nobody was making any money. They were just big, so they were included in the index. It does not necessarily mean they're any good. Uh, last week, I counted 44 companies in the index that weren't even making any money. Out of a 239 stock representation, that's a pretty big percentage of companies that can't even make a dime for their shareholders. We talked about this a little bit, so we're going to move on quickly. The other thing we've noticed in our review at Portfolio Analytics is investors like their mutual funds, they like their ETFs, and I can beat up mutual funds all day, that'll be a different uh, topic. But the key thing is to watch your over-diversification. So a lot of investors will have uh, you know, 25% bank weighting, for example, and then they will buy an ETF or a mutual fund to diversify. But what they fail to realize is that mutual fund or ETF is already loaded up on banks. So what they're actually doing is just increasing their exposure to another sector that maybe they don't want to. And that's a huge problem. So our system, what it does, it just looks at everything that the mutual fund and the ETF holds and overlays that to your own personal portfolio weightings. And we've found, found some really, really glaring errors in client portfolios where they think they're being more diversified but they're actually just loading up on a sector that they don't want to load up on. So keep an eye out for that for sure. Um, this, will be, uh, this presentation basically I think will be available, but essentially it just goes through the math in terms of if you add a 20% ETF, you might be adding 4 or 5% to a sector you don't want to add. And of course all the ETFs and most mutual funds in Canada, sorry the reverse, most mutual funds in Canada have all the same stocks. Um, as a former mutual fund manager, they just want to beat the index by a little bit, so they basically own the index, and the biggest decision for a lot of mutual fund managers is, 
Should I have BCE Enterprises at 5% or 5.5%? That's the biggest decision they have to make for the year. Canada represents only 4% of the world markets, so the other mistake we found clients are making is they forget this fact. It's all home country bias. They load up on Canadian stocks. They load up on banks. They load up on sectors that Canada is big on. And uh, they forget about all these great companies worldwide. So generally, when we run through our portfolio analytics for clients, we ask them what their risks are. And most want to have growth with minimal risk. And um, you know, there's a lot of huge companies worldwide where you can get steady growth with less risk. There are 300 billion companies, $400 billion companies, cash flow up to here. We just don't have those in Canada. So it's a situation where if those are your goals and you've got to walk through your goals first and what you want from your investments, you have to sort of look elsewhere because Canadian, the Canadian market doesn't have the universe to support those type of stocks. So then you talk about currency and everybody looks at the Canadian dollars like, is it going to go up and is it going to go down? And really, who cares? Currency is a diversifier. It is one form of diversification, just like sectors are, just like countries are, just like market capitalizations are, just like growth versus value. Forget about it. You don't need to pay uh, currency to hedge the currency. Over time, it's probably going to do OK. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that you go buy you know, Argentina currency, because that's going to go to zero. But just in terms of what you need to focus on, you don't have to worry about currency. And anyway, all these international companies that you're now buying because you're shifting out of Canada, most of them have global operations anyway. So you may think you're worried about currency, but meanwhile, the companies you're buying, they have business in 47 different currencies, and it's already covered. You're already diversified. You really don't have to worry about that too much. Also, if you're a snowbird or you go to Florida, then you, you want some US currency exposure to match your expenses and your income. So the other thing investors don't do is they fail to consider how much money they may actually be making. If you're still working and if you're, you know, if you're a 40-year-old person and you sort of hit, you've paid off some of your debts, you probably have more money coming in than going out. I mean, it's not, it's not the case for everyone, obviously. But if you do, you have to consider that cash flow income. If your job is secure, you don't need a 50% bond for portfolio. You don't need six months of expenses in terms of um, living expenses if there's a problem, because if your stocks are liquid enough, you can always sell an investment to match a new expense that you didn't uh, know about before. So a lot of advisors and a lot of banks are like, oh, you have to have 30% cash in case something goes wrong. And we kind of throw that out the window. It's like, you know what? If you own a liquid stock, you don't need a whole lot of cash. Why would you want to have 0.2% in the bank or earn 0.2% in the bank when you can earn a 4% dividend and get a tax advantage on that as well? It just makes no sense to us. Um, the other question that, or the other situation we come up with is investors just love their bonds too much. And, um, you know, sure, they're safe, sure, they provide income, but they're taxed at, the, at a higher rate, they can be volatile, and certainly they've done well as interest, interest rates have gone down, but one day interest rates might go up and you might not want your 35% fixed income exposure. So I'm just doing this because my timer keeps going off, so I apologize for that. Let's keep going. Um, the other thing that people uh, do, and we talked about this a little bit, is they worry far too much. Everybody's worried all the time. Um, there's always something to worry about in the stock market. And frankly, if you're not worried, that's the time to sell everything. Um, so right now, we probably have a pretty good uh, roadmap until Trump gets reelected or not. Um, certainly, he's not going to send out any neg negative tweets until he's reelected. You might get a little hiccup if he does get reelected and you get a situation where he doesn't care anymore. He can't get reelected again, so he'll just go a little bit more off the rails. Um, but I think the next year is going to probably be okay. But again, there's always risk. There, in my career, I've never had a situation where there's been clear sailing and everything's been awesome. There's always something to worry about. And just think about that a little bit. Every single investment that you've ever bought that's made money, you bought from someone who didn't think it was a good idea at the time to own it. Just think about that. You, you bought it, someone else hated it, and you made money. So. If you look for bad things or something to worry about, you're always going to find them. They're always out there. And sometimes you're going to make money, and sometimes you're going to lose. But when you make a lot of money on a stock, it makes up for so many losers that it's not going to matter over the long term. So I want to talk a little bit about risk a bit more. If you look at this chart, it's almost impossible to lose money on average over 10 years. 
Over 20 years, it is impossible to lose money based on what's happened in the past. And now, with markets at record highs or near record highs, I can calmly and confidently say every single investor in the world who bought on average, who has not sold, has made money. So the risk, everybody wants you to be scared. The investment industry wants you to be scared so you can give your money to the professionals. They want you to trade. They want you to buy the low volatility products. They want you to buy the closed end funds. They want you to move around. They want you to be worried so they can look after you. But the worry really is a little bit uh, over, overstated. And for a lot of investors, you don't have to worry that much. If you have 20 years, I could, I could say you could be 100% equities. You may not want that. That may not fit your profile. But certainly from a risk-reward point of view, why would I put you into any bonds if you have a 20-year time horizon? OK, we'll keep going. I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, the, the industry creates products, as I was mentioning, to um, capture that fear. So keep an eye out for those. Don't follow the trends. Again, you, we see a lot of this going on at 5i Research, where people are saying, what do you think about the cannabis stocks in, their, in our question and answers section? And now it's like, what about gold? So people are kind of shifting around, trying to find out what's hot. And we suggest just own most of the sectors, be diversified. I cannot tell you which sector is going to be hot tomorrow, and I don't think you can either. But if you own all 11 sectors, you're probably going to be okay. Okay, my time is up, and that is, I might make one more thing here. Pensions. If you have a pension, it's a huge, huge asset. We've looked at uh, individuals' pensions, and the present value of that pension can be worth uh, $1.2, $1.3 million, and you need to include that in your allocation. So if you have a giant pension, it's effectively a giant fixed income allocation, and perhaps your equity exposure should be much, much higher because you've got that cushion from a pension if you're in that fortunate situation. So thank you very much.